stories eleven and twelve of st andrew's ghost stories by william thomas linskill this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven the smothered piper of the west cliffs hush 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 here comes the bogeyman this was shouted out to me very loudly by a cheery golfing johnny as i entered the merry smoking-room of the old varsity golf club at coldham common cambridge some years ago draw in your armchair light a cigar or a pipe and tell us all many celebrated actors were present some of those wonderful bogey stories about dear st andrews it is the bogey time of the year and you must remember i played the bogey man for you in one of your big burlesque at st andrews and cupar's some years ago so fire away with the bogies please and be quick then i reeled off a big lot of yarns of the ghost thomas plater who murdered prior robert of montrose on the dormitory staircase before vespers of the nigger in a fuffshire house who is invisible himself but maps out his bare footmarks on the floor of the painted gallery of sharp's coat which being heard betokens a death of haunted old balcony ruined castle of the murdered pedlar in our own south street who sweeps down with a chilly hand the cheeks of invaders to his haunted cellar of the ghost that appeared in the house of archbishop ross mentioned in lyon's history and of the terrible ghost in the novum hospitium which so alarmed people that its dwelling had to be pulled down and only a fragment of the building now remains but they wanted to hear the tale of the ghostly piper of the west cliffs so i told them the legend as i had heard it years ago it seems that in the old days no houses existed on the cliffs from the old castle of hamilton to the modern monument near the witch hill it was all meadowland much used for the grazing of cattle and sheep and also much frequented as a playground for bygone children on and over the face of the cliffs slightly to the westward of butts wind existed then the entrance to a fearsome cave or old ecclesiastical passage which was a terror to many and most people shunned it it had many names among them the jingling cove the jingling man's hole john's coal hole and later the piper's cave or grave a few of the oldest inhabitants still remember it a few knew a portion of it none dared venture beyond this well-known portion like the interior of an old ice-house it was dark chilly and clammy its walls ran with cold sweat it was partly natural but mostly artificial a most dark creepy and fearsome place in a description which i got of it many years ago and which appeared in the st andrew citizen i learn that the opening of this cliff passage was small and triangular it was situated on a projecting ledge of rock and it was high enough after entering to enable a full-sized man to stand upright from the opening it was a steep incline down for a distance of forty-nine feet thereafter it proceeded in a level direction for over seventy feet while it descended into a chamber at the further end of this chamber were two if not more passages branching off from it between the passages was cut out in the rock a latin cross this would seem to point to an ecclesiastical connection and had nothing whatever to do with the more modern smuggler's cave near the ladies bathing place but enough of description in bygone days in a small cottage little better than a hovel situated in argyle lived an old dame named goodman she occupied one room and her son and his young wife tenanted the other little chamber he was a merry daredevil happy-go-lucky lad and he was famed as one of the best players on the bagpipes in all fife he would have pleased even maggie louder of nights at all hours he would make the old grass-grown streets lively with his music jock the piper was a favourite among both young and old he was much interested in the tale of the old west cliff cave and took a bet on with some cronies that on a new year's night he would investigate the mysteries of the place and play his pipes up it as far as he could go his old mother his wife and many of his friends tried hard to dissuade him from doing so foolish and so foolhardy a thing but he remained obdurate and firmly stuck to his bet 
on a dark new year's night he started up the mysterious cavern with his pipes playing merrily and they were heard it is said passing beneath market street then they died away they suddenly ceased and were never more heard he and his well-known pipes were never seen again somewhere beneath st andrews lies the whitened bones of that bygone piper lad with his famous pipes beside him attempts were made to find him but without avail no one not even the bravest dared to venture into that passage full of damp foul air his mother and wife were distracted and the young wife used to sit for hours at the mouth of that death-trap cave finally her mind gave way and she used to wander at all hours down to the mouth of the cave where her husband had vanished the following new year's night she left the little college in argyle and putting a shawl over her wasted shoulders turned to the old woman and said i'm going to my jock morning came but she never returned home she had indeed gone to her lost jock for years after the small crouching figure of a woman could be seen on moonlit nights perched on the rock balcony of the fatal cave dim and shadowy and transparent wild shrieks and sounds of weird pipe music were constantly heard coming from out of that entrance in after years when the houses were built the mouth of this place was either built or covered up and its memory only remains to us but what of piper jacques he it is said still walks the edge of the old cliffs and his presence is heralded by an icy breath of cold air and ill be it for any one who meets or sees his phantom form or hears his pipe music he seems to have the same effect as the ghost of nell cook in the dark entry at canterbury mentioned in the ingoldsby legends from which i must quote a few verses and though two hundred years have flown nell cook doth still pursue her weary walk and they who cross her path the deed may rue her fatal breath is fell as death the sea-moon's blast is not more dire a wind in africa that blows uncommon hot but all unlike the sea-moon's blast her breath is deadly cold delivering quivering shivering shocks upon both young and old and whoso in the entry dark doth feel that fatal breath he ever dies within the year some dire untimely death so it is with him who meets piper jock by jove interrupted the golfing johnny has any one seen him lately i only know of one man i said who told me that one awful night in a heavy thunderstorm he had heard wild pipe music and seen the figure of a curiously dressed piper walking along the cliff edge where no mortal could walk at a furious speed what do you think of it all asked my golfing friend i don't know i'm sure i am not receptive and don't see ghosts but if i could only find now the mouth of that place i bet another jacques and i would get along it and find out the whereabouts of jacques the piper and his poor little wife here is my handsome good night don't forget the piper and they haven't end of story eleven story twelve the beautiful white lady of the haunted tower how very very lovely she was to be sure of whom are you speaking i asked of some of the orchid or veronique people or of some of your own company i did not know you were hard hit old chap i was sitting in the smoking-room of the great northern hotel king's cross talking to an old friend an oxford man but now the manager of a big theatrical company when he suddenly made the above remark no no of none of those people he replied but our talking of st andrews reminded me of a ghost a phantom or a spectre call it what you choose i saw in that ancient city several years ago no horrid bogey but a very lovely girl indeed by jove i said tell me about it i want a new ghost story very badly indeed i know a lot of them but perhaps this is something new and spicy i am sure i do not know if it be new he replied i have never seen anything spectral before or since but i saw that lovely woman three different times it must be fully ten years ago i saw her twice on the scores and once in an old house well i must really hear all about it i said please fire away all right all right he said now for her first appearance 
i was living in st andrews at the time it must have been the end of january or beginning of february and i was strolling along to the kirkhill after dinner and enjoying the fine evening and the keen sea breeze and thinking about the old old days of the castle and cathedral of beaton's ghost and many other queer tales when a female figure glided past me she was in a long flowing white dress and had her beautiful dark hair hanging down past her waist i was very much astonished to see a girl dressed in such a manner wandering about alone at such an hour and i followed her along for several yards when lo just after she had passed the turret light she completely vanished near the square tower which i was afterwards informed was known as the haunted tower i hunted all around the place carefully but saw nothing more than night queer wasn't it certainly it was i remarked but i know dozens of weird stories connected with that old tower but what more have you to tell me well he continued as you may imagine the whole affair worried and puzzled me considerably but it was gradually vanishing from my mind when near the same place i saw her again i had my sister with me this time and we both can swear to it it was a lovely night with a faint moon and as the white lady swept past quite silently we saw the soft trailing dress and the long black wavy hair there was something like a rosary hanging from her waist and a cross or a locket hanging round her throat as she passed she turned her head towards us and we both noticed her beautiful features especially her brilliant eyes she vanished as before near that old tower my sister was so awfully frightened that i had to hurry her off home we were both absolutely convinced we had seen a being not of this world a face never to be forgotten how strange i said you know several people saw a girl in that built-up old turret lying in her coffin a former priest of the episcopal church here saw some masons repairing the wall of that tower and their chisel fell into the turret through a chink on removing a stone they came upon a chamber within and they saw a girl dressed in white with long hair lying in a coffin wanting the lid the whole was built up again at once i know and have often talked to persons who saw her there one of them was a mason employed at the work the doorway of the tower is opened up now and a grill put in but there is no sign of the girl queer stories arose some said it was the remains of princess murin daughter of constantine others said it was the embalmed body of some sweet girl saint concealed there in times of trouble and so on but finish your story i have little more to tell he answered some months afterwards i was a guest in an old house in fifeshire and was given the turret room on the second night i went to bed early as i had been at golf all day and felt awfully dead beat i must have fallen asleep suddenly as i left my candle burning on the table all of a sudden i woke up with a start to find the now familiar figure of the white lady at the foot of my bed she was gazing at me intently when i sat up she glided away behind the screen at the door i jumped up put on my dressing-gown seized the candle and made for the door the lady was gone and the door was as i left it when i went to bed locked i unlocked it flung it open and looked into the passage there she was i saw the white dress the splendid hair the rosary and the gold locket quite plainly she turned her lovely face to me and smiled a sweet pathetic smile gently raised her hand and floated away towards the picture gallery now for the end next day my kind hostess took me through the old gallery i saw pictures of all ages sorts and sizes but imagine my amazement when i saw the white lady the same white dress the lovely sweet face and splendid eyes the rosary and a locket which i now saw on it the arms of queen mary and lord darnley who on earth is that i asked you seem interested in that painting said mrs blank well that is a portrait of one of the lovely mary stuart's maries she was madly in love with castler the french minstrel and after he was beheaded at st andrews she became a nun and it is said died of grief in her nunnery that is all old boy he said and it is late 
i think it seems right that girl and i my sister saw must have been the spirit of marie blank and perhaps it was she who was the occupant of that haunted tower who knows but i shall never never see such a divinely beautiful face on this earth again End of story 12. Stories 13 and 14 of St. Andrew's Ghost Stories by William Thomas Linskill. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 13 Concerning More Appearances of the White Lady. I had been invited and was sitting at tea with a very dear old lady friend of mine not long ago it may seem strange but tea is i consider an extra and an unnecessary meal it does not appeal to me in the least and only spoils one's dinner and digestion the reason i went to tea was because in her note to me the lady mentioned that she had read my book of ghost stories and that she was interested in ghosts in general and st andrew's ghosts in particular and that she knew lots of such stories in the days of her girlhood in st andrew's now about eighty-five years ago that is why i went to eat cakes with sugar hot buttered toast and drink tea as black as senna or a black draught she had also informed me in the note that she could tell me a lot about the haunted tower and the beautiful white lady it took some time to get her to that point she would talk about archbishop sharp and his haunted house in the pens road of the ghost seen by archbishop ross of my friend the veiled nun of the cathedral and mr john knox of hungus king of the picts of constantine thomas plater and various others she told me a long tale of the raynham ghost in norfolk known as the brown lady of raynham whom her father and captain Marriott both saw and so on at last we got near the subject i wished information on in my young days she said st andrews was quite a wee bit place with grass-grown streets red-tiled houses outside stairs queer narrow ones not over clean only a few lights at night here and there an old ballad or oil lamp hanging at street corners every one believed in sharp's phantom coach in those good old days did you ever see it i queried no she said but i have heard it rumble past and i know those who have seen it and many other things too but tell me about the white lady please i said i will few people in those days cared to pass that haunted tower after nightfall if they did they ran past it and also the castle those new-fangled incandescent gas lamps have spoiled it all now the white lady was one of the maries one of the maids of honour to poor martyred mary of scotland they said then she was madly in love with the french poet and minstrel castellar and he was hopelessly in love like many others with marie's lovely mistress the queen of scots was she supposed to be the girl seen in the built-up haunted tower i asked that i really can't say she said there was a story often told in the old days that a beautiful embalmed girl in white lay in that tower and it was there and near the castle that she used to appear to the people you know poor castellar the handsome minstrel said and did some stupid things and was beheaded at the castle and was probably buried near there get me from that shelf white melville's novel the queen's marie's i did as she bade me well you will see there that the night before castellar was to be beheaded kind queen mary sent one of her maries the one who loved castellar at her own special request to the castle with her ring to offer him a pardon if he left this country for ever this marie did see castellar showed him the queen's ring and pleaded with him to comply but he refused he preferred death to banishment from his beloved queen's court and the fair messenger left him obstinate in his dungeon this faithful marie paced up and down all that night before the castle then at dawn came the sound of a gun or culverin a wreath of smoke floated out to sea and castellar was gone white melville says she did not start she did not shriek nor faint nor quiver but she threw her hood back and looked wildly upward gasping for air 
then as the rising sun shone on her bare head marie's raven hair was all streaked and patched with grey when marie stuart fled to england this faithful marie now no more needed became a nun in st andrews look at page three seventy one of white melville's book she said so i read it was an early harvest that year in scotland but ere the barley was white marie had done with nuns and nunneries vows and ceremonies withered hopes and mortal sorrows and had gone to that place where the weary heart can alone find the rest it had so longed for at last the pathetic and the comic often go together just at this interesting point a cat sprang suddenly up and upset a cup of tea in the lap of my genial hostess this created a diversion old ladies are apt to wander which is annoying she got clean away from her subject for a bit she asked me if i knew captain robert marshall who wrote plays and the haunted mayor i said i knew bob well and that he was an old madras college boy she then wanted to know if i knew how to pronounce the name of mr travis's american putter and if mr lowe or i had ever tried it she also wanted to know if i knew anything of the new patent clock worked on gramophone principles which shouted the hours instead of striking them having answered all these queries to her satisfaction and taken another cup of senna i mean tea i got her back to the white lady oh yes my dear she said i saw her i and some friends a lot of us had been out at kinkle bray's one afternoon and stayed there long past the time allowed us it was almost dark and we scuttled up the bray from the harbour rather frightened just near the turret light we saw the lady gliding along the top of the old abbey wall she was robed in a grey-white dress with a veil over her head she had raven-black hair and a string of beads hanging from her waist we all huddled together with our eyes and mouths wide open and watched the figure it's a girl sleepwalking i murmured it's a bride answered another oh she'll fall said a little boy grasping my arm but she did not she went inside the parapet wall at the haunted tower and vanished completely it's a ghost it's the white lady we all shrieked and ran off trembling home my sister also saw her on one of the turrets in the abbey wall where she was seen by several people some months later as i was doing my hair before my looking-glass the same face looked over my shoulder and i fainted i have always felt an eerie feeling about a looking-glass ever since even now old woman as i am her lovely face is one never never to be forgotten having once seen it but your new-fashioned lamps have altered everything and what do you think about it now i asked her i have told you all i know the lady used to be seen oftenest between the castle and that old turret perhaps she came to look at the last resting-place of her much-loved and wayward minstrel castellar maybe she came to revisit the favourite haunts of her beloved girl queen truly called the queen of the roses but to my dying day i shall never forget that face that lovely pathetic face i saw years ago and which may still be seen by some what must you really go now won't you have another cup of tea oh very well good-bye as i wended my way clubwards i could not but think of the strange tale i had just heard and of castellar's sad end and i could not help wondering if i should ever be favoured with a sight of this beautiful white lady end of story thirteen story fourteen a spiritualistic seance the mcwhiskers whom i met at oban were very jolly old people papa mcwhisker had made a big fortune tea-planting in ceylon and had bought and added to dramdotty college in the far far north they were perfectly full of ghosts and spiritualism and at dramdotty they seemed to have a ghost for every day in the week on monday there was the spotted nun on tuesday the floating infant on wednesday the headless dwarf on thursday the vanishing nigger on friday the burnt lady and on saturday the human balloon and on sunday the whole lot attended on them and i dare say went to the kirk with them 
mcwhisker himself was a jovial soul fond of his toddy and very much resembled the dougal crater in rob roy my friend john clyde should have seen him he had a furious red head of hair and beard of the same colour and the street boys used to call after him the song the folks all call me carroty what 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 oh carroty etc mrs mcwhisker was a stout lady with eyes like small tomatoes and a gimlet nose they had a son a boy of ten called fernando mcwhisper because he was born in spain when they came to st andrews they had purchased a number of my ghost books these ghosts at present chiefly haunt the citizen warehouse bookseller's shops and the railway bookstall that is a reason perhaps that the mcwhiskers invited me to a spiritualistic seance at their house in south street they generally came to st andrews for the winter partly to get away from the cold of their northern home and partly because they thought the history and atmosphere of st andrews lent itself to an all-pervading presence of ghosts spooks and spirits i had only been to two such shows before one at helsensburg and one at cambridge and was and still am very doubtful of the genuineness of spiritualism on the day appointed i went to the mcwhiskers house in south street and was shown in by a highlander in a mcwhisker tartan it was early in the afternoon but i found the shutters in the large room all shut and a few dim lights only were burning on a sideboard in the corner stood plenty of refreshments and everything else to comfort the inner man in the centre of the room there was a round table covered with a mcwhisker tartan tablecloth which touched the floor all round this in itself was suspicious to my mind i was introduced to the chief medium one mr peter fancourt who looked as if he had been buried and dug up again he was in tight sleek black clothes and resembled in every way uriah heep and david copperfield the other medium was a mrs flytrap corncockle they were supposed not to know each other but i am as certain that they were accomplices as that the bell rock is near st andrew's bay a number of chairs encircled the table we had all to seat ourselves on these chairs with our thumbs and little fingers touching round the edge of the table the first thing that happened was a kind of squish and then a huge bouquet of flowers descended on the table from somewhere it was a clever trick but the flowers were of the commonest sort and what i had seen in all the greengrocers shops that morning the lights were now turned very low and a spirit arm and hand appeared floating about which shone a good deal it hovered about from the ceiling to above our heads and when i got a chance i jumped on a chair and seized it with both hands it seemed to shrink up and was torn through my hands very forcibly and in such a material manner that i was forced to let go i don't know where the hand and arm went to but it was simply a juggling trick after this mr heep i beg his pardon mr fancourt said that there was an unbeliever present and as i was that unbeliever i was relegated to an armchair by the fireplace with one of mcwhisker's muckle cigars from that point of vantage i watched the whole affair and they assured me they would tell me all that was going on the next very curious thing was that they suddenly all took their hands off the table and their eyes slowly followed something ceiling words it was funny to see them all lying back staring up at the roof then very slowly their heads and eyes resumed their normal position did you see that said the mcwhisker triumphantly i saw nothing whatever i remarked what did you not see the table float up to the ceiling it remained there quite half a second and then came down as lightly as a feather i was watching the table the whole time i said and it never moved an inch from its place oh you are an unbeliever said mrs mcwhisker sadly but later on when it is darker you will see mr fancourt float out of one of the windows and come in at the other i fervently hoped if he did anything of the kind he would come a cropper on the pavement below and break some of his ribs the table then started to dance about and move along but this i am certain was simply engineered by those two mediums 
after some tomfoolery of this kind they all agreed that ouija should be brought out a large oblong yellow board was then produced and laid on the table on it were the letters of the alphabet and a number of figures also the sun moon and stars and some other fantastic symbols on this board was placed a small tablet with a round body and round head it had three hind legs and a front which was the pointer these legs had little red velvet boots on the two mediums then placed their hands on each side of this curious table which immediately began to run about to the letters and figures spelling out things and fixing dates in answer to questions asked it was not the least like a planchette which is on wheels the first thing they informed me it had said was that a spirit called clarissa was present and for many years she had lain a-dying in that room she maintained that she was some distant relation of the white lady of the haunted tower it then rushed into poetry its first effort was the legend of purple james and his girl a comic thing which reminded me of the bab ballads they afterwards gave me a copy of this poem which i still possess next the spirit gave us a scotch poem about a haggis and then one called edward and the hard-boiled egg it then devoted its attention to me whom it characterized as the unbeliever it stated that if the antiquarian society would dig a pit four feet square by six feet deep between the two dungeons in the kitchen tower of the castle and if the rock were cut through a cave would be found full of casks of good red wine on no condition whatever would i on such evidence recommend the society to strike a pick in there the next spirit that turned up was one jasper codlever he alluded to me as the cambridge man in the chair with a cigar he said that if excavations were made between the two last trees in law park wood a stone cist would be found full of pictish ornaments again he told us that within a cave on the cliffs there was a chalice of great value placed there by isabella the nun who still guarded it by night and day and was very dangerous to approach this spirit then went away and his place was taken by a monk named rudolph who informed us that the entrance to the crypt or sub chapel was between two of the pillars in the priory as there are a lot of pillars there it is impossible to know which he meant he said this entrance was near roger's tomb who roger may be i know not he then told us about this crypt he said there was something so horrible in it that it turned him sick curiously enough some thought-reading people told us the same story in the town hall some years ago but they said the underground chapel was at the east end of the cathedral the monk then went on to tell us of this place in the priory he said it had purebeck marble pillars a well of clear water and three small costly altars and a number of books of the vincentian canons there was a short interval now and the lights were turned up i was anxious to get away but they implored me to stay and see the cabinet and the spirits therein i told them in my most dramatic fashion that i was late already and i had a meeting on mcwhisker then begged me if i would not stay to see the spirits to taste some and he mixed me an excellent whisky and soda which he called a blegori i then made my adieu and was very glad to get once more into the street and also into a world of sense the mcwhiskers informed me some days afterwards that they were very sorry at my leaving as after i had gone fancourt had floated out of the window and numerous wonderful spirits had appeared in the cabinet i am glad i went when i did as i should certainly have taken a poker to that cabinet End of story 14stories fifteen sixteen and seventeen of st andrew's ghost stories by william thomas lenskill this librivox recording is in the public domain story fifteen the apparition of sir roger de wanklin i am very fond indeed of christmas time there has been little snow this season i think it has forgotten how to snow in these days 
still i always feel christmassy i think of the good old coaching days when there was really snow of washington irving and good old dickens and scott of the yule log and the family gatherings and reunions of the wassail bowl of frumenty and plum porridge and mince pies plum puddings and holly and mistletoe and big dances in the servants hall of good old ancestral ghosts and hearty good cheer i am sitting to-day in a cosy armchair of the old school no modern fake talking to my old friend theophilus greenbracket phyllis as i call him is a clever man of many parts he is a great traveller and sportsman and takes a deep interest in every mortal thing there is nothing of the killjoy or fossil about greenbracket he is up to date and true blue he is sitting opposite me smoking a gigantic cigar and imbibing rum punch and talking hard he always talks hard but is never a bore and never palls on one in the slightest degree he has an enormous dog at his feet with a fierce vindictive expression which belies its real nature as it is gentle with everything and everybody except cats and rats greenbracket is among many other things a great spiritualist and visionary and possesses all kinds of mediumistic appliances such as pithos planchettes and ouijas which he works with his old butler amos bradley who is another spirit hunter by the by said greenbracket i am at present taking lessons in music with mr easeboy he says this so suddenly that he makes me jump as we were talking about sea serpents and the probability of their existence are you indeed old chap i said yes thorough bass and the consecutive fifths and harmony and all that sort of thing you know he has a pupil a macbeth church timber who has just written a thundering pretty waltz called eleanor wynne i thought church timber i mildly suggested only played severe classical stuff oh yes replied my friend but he occasionally touches on a lighter theme and has even written a comic song called i lay beside a milestone with a sunflower on my brow i must try it some day i said but how about your ghosts have you seen any lately there was one here a few minutes ago said greenbracket a tall man in armour sitting in that corner over there what rubbish i said quite crossly you dream things or drink or eat too much no i don't said greenbracket do you really mean to tell that you felt no sensation just now no pricking or tingling feeling or a chilly sensation down your back certainly not nothing of the kind i replied well that is queer he said i know you don't see these things but i fancied you would have felt a strange presence in some way i don't know who the man in armour was i have not seen him before but my butler has at all events it was not sir roger de wanklin who the blank is he i queried oh said my host he is the earthbound spirit of an architect who lived in st andrews at the time that james v married mary of lorraine in the cathedral he says he was present at the ceremony and can describe it all a gay pageant it was and much revelry if you can get all this sort of curious information which i don't exactly credit why on earth can't you find out something practical and useful for instance where the secret underground hiding-place is and where all the tons of valuable ornaments papers and vestments are concealed my dear friend said greenbracket solemnly these people won't be pumped they only tell you what they choose to or are permitted to reveal if they really do turn up and talk to you as you say they do why on earth can't you get them to talk some useful sense i really can't force their confidence said greenbracket all they do tell me voluntarily is most interesting and absorbing this sir roger planned numerous very important structural alterations in the cathedral and elsewhere it is all very odd to me i said one meets people with strange ideas i met a man years ago at abertswith who was a firm believer in the transmigration of souls he said he quite remembered being a cab horse in glasgow and was certain when he left this planet he would become a parrot in mars 
i don't understand that sort of thing a bit said my extraordinary friend greenbracket but sir roger de wanklin has sometimes to visit the valley of fire and frost where there are mighty furnaces on one side of him and ice and snow on the other and it is very painful i had that sort of experience the other day i remarked at a meeting on one side was a furnace of a fire and on the other a window wide open with a biting frost wind blowing in oh tuts said greenbracket that's here i'm talking of the spirit world hang your spirit stuff has your butler amos bradley seen any spooky things lately yes he is much annoyed by the spirit of an evil old housekeeper here who lost her life by falling downstairs and she is continually pushing him down my cellar stairs he is furious is this a butler of yours any connection of jeremiah anklebone i asked yes he is a cousin said greenbracket all that family have second sight and see and dream strange things and who i ask may this housekeeper be who pitched your butler downstairs oh said greenbracket she's a badly constituted wraith and her name is annabel strongthorn she was housekeeper ages ago to this sir roger de ranklin in this very old house we are in what happened to this sir roger has he told you oh yes he fell over the cliffs bless me and did this old housekeeper woman push him over was she a murderess oh how can i tell said greenbracket peevishly he has told me nothing of the kind well old fellow i said you really do not get much interesting information out of your ghostly friends but what i like about you is that all your numerous ghosts come straight to you straight to headquarters at once you don't go fooling about with chairs and tables and sideboards and other pieces of timber in an idiotic way if as some people say they can get chairs and tables and other articles of furniture to follow them about why don't they go in for cheap furniture removals at night when the streets are empty don't make a joke of everything said greenbracket i do see and converse with departed spirits i do not ask them to come they come to me and half of them i have never heard of before or thought of either may i ask my good friend greenbracket what sort of clothes they wear when they pay you these visits for instance what does your latest apparition sir roger clothe himself in bless me said theophilus why in the dress of his times of course a jerkin a doublet and hose a rapier and all that sort of things sometimes he wears a sort of coarse fustian cassock with a double breast i can't make out i said to my spiritualistic friend where these clothes come from have they got a sort of a theatrical wardrobe wherever they are existing if so why can't the ghosts of old world clothes come alone in such a case you might see a modern suit of evening togs or armor or boots and spurs or military dress walk into your room without anything inside them or you might with a stretch of imagination see a suit of pajamas or a pair of slippers going about the place shut up talking like that said theophilus you don't possess the sense i mean the extra sense to see these things but read this document i have written out surely it will convince you that i really do get valuable inspirations from other worlds but mind keep it a strict secret at present all right i promise you i murmured placidly then i perused carefully the more than extraordinary document he had handed me it is very curious i said if it be one bit true and if genuine might be extremely useful mind my lips are sealed but from whom did you obtain this remarkable story from sir roger de wanklin the cathedral architect he replied and off i went quite full of my queer friend greenbracket and of annabel strongthorn amos bradley and his cousin anklebone and particularly roger de wanklin end of story fifteen story sixteen the bewitched ermintrude very many years ago now i was sauntering down historic old south street one november afternoon my object being to lunch in one of the quaint houses with my old-time friend harold slitherwick lunch was not however the main object of my visit 
but to meet a man called reginald sadiger an ex-indian judge who had actually seen a genuine spirit or ghost it is a sad nay a melancholy fact for i have been told this by the very best authorities that i am not psychic despite the fact that i have spent days and nights in gloomy grimly haunted chambers and ruins and even a lonesome halloween night on the summit of st rule's ancient tower my only companions being sandwiches matches some cigars and the necessary and indispensable flask yet alas i have never heard or seen anything the least abnormal or felt the necessary or much talked of mystic presence arrived at the old mansion i was duly ushered in by slitherick's butler one joe bingworthy a man with the manner and appearance of an archbishop and from whom one always seemed to expect a sort of pontifical blessing there were several fellows there and i was speedily made known to sediger a very cheery pleasant little person with dark hair and big eyebrows there was a very heated discussion going on when i entered as to what was really a properly constituted cathedral darkwood was shouting no bishop's chair no cathedral if he said a bishop had his chair in a tiny chapel it was a cathedral but if a religious building was as big as the crystal palace and there was no bishop's chair there it was not one bit a cathedral i stopped this discussion suddenly by asking sediger about his ghost and was told i would hear the whole story after lunch before we adjourned to the smoke-room sediger was telling us he felt a bit knocked up with his long journey he had a thirty-six hours journey after he left good old tony pandy visions of tony lumpkin and tony faust in my sweetheart flitted through my brain then i suddenly remembered luckily that tony bandy was a town in wales once comfortably seated in the smoke-room with pipes cigars and whisky reginald sadiger became at once the centre of all the interest lots of years ago he said in a quiet legal voice i came to visit some friends in st andrews and i had a most unaccountable experience i will tell you all about it i never saw anything supernatural before and have never seen anything the least remarkable since but one night my first night in that house i undoubtedly saw the wraith of the blue girl what had you for supper that evening i mildly asked only chicken and salad was the reply i was not thinking of anything ghostly if you fix your mind intently on one thing some folk can you can self-hypnotize yourself i had no idea but golf on my mind when i went off to roost well drive ahead said i i had a charming comfortable big old-world room given me nice fire and all that sort of thing continued sediger and as i was deuced tired i soon went to bed and to sleep i woke suddenly later with the firm conviction that a pair of eyes were fixed on me i suppose every one knows that if you stare fixedly at any sleeping person they will soon awake i got a start when i half opened my eyes for leaning on the mantelpiece staring hard at me in the mirror was a most beautiful girl in a light blue gauzy dress her back of course was to the bed and i saw she had masses of wavy golden brown hair hanging down long past her waist i was utterly astonished and watched the movements of this beautiful creature with my eyes almost closed i felt sure it was some one in the house having a lark at my expense so pretended to be asleep as i watched the girl turned round and faced me and i marvelled at the extraordinary loveliness of her figure and features i wondered if she was a guest in the house and what she was doing wandering about at that time of night and if she was sleepwalking she then glided it certainly was not walking to a corner of the room and then i noticed that her feet were bare she seemed to move along above the carpet not on it a curious motion she drifted and stood beneath a big picture took out a key and opened a small ombre or cupboard in the wall quite noiselessly and from this receptacle she took out some small things that glittered in her pretty fingers long taper fingers 
how on earth did you contrive to see all that in a dark bedroom i sarcastically inquired the room wasn't dark said sadiger i always keep the light burning in a strange house and in a strange room oh i see i replied go on well continued reginald sadiger she then turned and came towards the bed and i got a more distinct view of her i had never seen any one a bit like her before it was an utterly unforgettable face i have certainly never before or since seen any one as pretty as she was yet it was a strange unearthly beauty and her huge forget-me-not blue eyes were a perfection of pathos nearer and yet nearer she came and when quite close to the bed she bent over me and raised her hand with the glittering thing in it high over my head then i made a tremendous spring out of bed crying loudly now i'll see who is trying to frighten me i flung out my arms to grasp her but they closed on nothing and to my utter astonishment i saw her standing smiling at me on the opposite side of the room that was odd and uncanny enough but then she gradually began to disappear dissolving into a thin blue-gray mist until nothing whatever remained i was absolutely alone in the room and dumbfounded what next i asked well what could i do or think said sadiger i was fairly flabbergasted at the unexpected turn of events i admit i felt shaky so i took a stiff whisky and soda smoked a pipe and went back to bed to reflect on the matter and fell asleep i was awakened in the morning by my host harold slitherwick walking into the room carrying a pony brandy for me well old blighter how have you slept he asked then i told him about the blue girl bless my heart have you seen her too lots of people my wife among the number declare they have seen her but as you have seen her now i really began to believe there is some truth in the tale i then told my host there was no dubiety about the matter and pointed out the place under the picture where there was a cupboard we both went and looked there was no cupboard to be seen very rum thing said my host there was a murder once took place in this room ages ago perhaps the blue lady had something to do with it but let us hunt for your cupboard on rapping with our knuckles on the wall we found a hollow spot scraped off the paper and there sure enough was the little door i had seen we soon forced it open and discovered a receptacle about a foot square going very deep into the thick stone wall there were a lot of things in that place scissors a thimble a dagger a workbox and a lot of old musty dusty papers and then we found a long tress of ruddy gold hair in an envelope and a beautiful miniature magnificently painted on ivory of the blue girl i had seen every detail the face the dress the hair and the bare feet were perfectly exact on both the envelope and the miniature were written the names ermentrude ermengarde annabelle beaupari with the date fifteen fifty nine we then examined the old documents which gave us some clue to the mystery it was a very long story that we had to read over but i will tell it to you briefly long ago this ancient house was the property of a frenchman monsieur louis beaupierre he had an only and lovely daughter of twenty named ermentrude ermengarde annabelle beaupierre who was intended to be a bride of the church otherwise a nun this idea apparently did not appeal to her views she passionately loved a young student and was equally beloved by him whose name was eugene malvoisin all went well it seems for two years and they were to be married in the cathedral at easter all the arrangements were complete for the nuptials but fortune is a fickle jade and willed it otherwise a rival turned up on the scene in the person of marie de Maros, a cousin of beaurepaire and a frequent guest at their house ermentrude found that her beloved eugene had proved faithless and transferred his youthful affections to the lovely marie and that a speedy elopement was pending ermentrude went and consulted a wise woman otherwise a witch who resided in argyle out with the shoegate port 
this witch by name alliston braithwaite used her evil powers on the fair ermentrude and enraged her jealousy to fury and a desire for revenge and presented her with a potion and a cunning well-wrought dagger the witch threw a spell over ermentrude and took all the good within her away and implanted evil passions within her breast it seems that marie of malros slept in this old room and one night ermentrude willed by the witch went to marie's bedside and planted the dagger in her heart and she died it seems ermentrude disappeared and was never seen or heard of again and was supposed to have drowned herself at the maiden rock hence the name it bears that said sadiger is my quaint tale the room i slept in was the very room in which in ages past marie was done to death by ermentrude and it seems to have been my lot to see ermentrude and discover the secret that lay in that old cupboard we all thanked sadiger and after thoughtfully consuming a few more whiskies and sodas and a few more cigars went off to the links pondering deeply End of story sixteen story seventeen a very peculiar house last time i visited cambridge i was invited by a friend to meet a party of merry undergraduates they had all nicknames and what their real names were i cannot remember there was mike and whiffle toddy bulger the infant eddie smith from ramsgate and the coal scuttle we had a most sumptuous repast as only can be supplied by first-class cambridge kitchens and to which we did ample justice we were smoking after lunch when they informed me that they had taken the liberty of making an engagement for me to go to tea with such a dear old lady called sister elfrida at a house in bridge street opposite st clement's church on the following day at four thirty as she wished to tell me some ghostly experiences she had had at st andrews of course i said i would go very gladly they asked me before i went if i could take them behind the scenes that night at the cambridge theatre this i had to flatly refuse as no undergraduates are allowed within the sacred precincts of the stage door next day was a damp raw typical cambridge day i wended my way to bridge street and easily found the house i was going to as i had once lodged there the rooms were kept by two old women who might be called decayed gentlewomen their name was monkswood and they had been nicknamed the cruets namely pepper and vinegar very different from them was their niece a lovely young actress who was known on the stage as patricia glencluse who was uh, quite the rage in musical comedy and who it was rumoured abroad would soon become a duchess the door was opened by patricia herself who said oh i thought it might be you sister elfrida told me you were coming to tea you will like her she is such a darling just like the belle of new york only grown older if you write anything about what she tells you mind you send it to me to the whittington company theatre birmingham of course i will i said and i will put you in it now come along upstairs and i will introduce you to her she said she tapped at a door and then opened it and ushered me into the presence of the sister look here sister said patricia i have brought the ghost man from st andrews to see you here he is very good of you said the sister as she shook hands with me warmly you know she said i have read all your ghost tales she then told patricia to run downstairs and send the servant up with tea then we seated ourselves down to tea and muffins and the old lady related her story she said i wanted very much to tell you of a little experience i had some months ago i was asked to come up for a short time to look after an invalid lady who lived at st andrews well i arrived safely there and went from the station to the house in a bus it was an old house and when i entered i felt a queer sort of creepy sensation come over me such as i had never experienced before i was ushered into the presence of my host and hostess and the invalid lady he was a splendid example of an old british soldier and his wife was a pretty fragile-looking old piece of china 
the invalid lady i found only suffered from nerves and very little wonder i thought in such a peculiar house i had always a fancy that some other human being resided in the house but if so it only remained a feeling the name of the cook was timbletoss the butler was corncockle and oddly enough they both came from cambridge what curious names there are here i said to the sister when i first went to cambridge i thought the names over the shops must be some gigantic joke a man once suggested to me that some one must have been specially engaged to come to cambridge and invent those wonderful names well continued the sister it really was a most extraordinary house i had never seen anything out of the common before and i have never seen anything like that house since the servants told me most remarkable tales how the bedclothes were twitched off the bed in the night by unseen hands and how the tables and chairs rattled about over the floor and the knives and forks flew off the table curious little coloured flames known there as burbilangs used to float about in the air at night and corncockle the butler said the beer taps in the cellar were constantly turned on and the gas turned off the servants had to have their wages considerably raised to keep them in the house at luncheon on several occasions the lady used to jump up and run out of the room in great haste and did not reappear till dinner when she looked very white and shaky on two occasions i was ordered to go at once to my room and lock the door and remain there until the old squire sounded the hall gong they seemed very much perturbed when i got down again i will only mention one or two curious things i saw one was a quaint creature called the mutilated football which slotted downstairs in front of me and when it reached the lobby a head and a pair of arms and legs appeared and it pattered off down the cellar stairs at a breakneck speed the story goes that this creature was once a great athlete and football player and when he got old and fat would insist on still playing though warned not to do so he got such a severe kick that his ribs were broken and he died on the field i never heard the true story of the animated hairpin but i saw it once seated in an armchair in the dining-room it looked as if it had on black tights and close-fitting black jersey it had a very long white face with great round eyes like an owl's and black hair standing on end to a great height when it saw me it got up quickly from the chair bowed very low till its head nearly touched the ground and then walked in a most stately manner out of the room then i saw the green lady a tall beautiful girl with very long hair and a rustling green brocaded dress she glided along as if on wheels that this was no imagination of mine may be drawn from the fact that one day when i had a little girl to tea she suddenly clutched my arm and asked me who that beautiful lady in green with the long hair was who had gone past the door on roller skates i will not enlarge now on the bangings crashes thumpings and tappings that resounded through the rooms at all times of day and night sometimes on the ceilings sometimes on the walls and sometimes on the floors the doors and windows too had a nasty habit of suddenly opening without any visible cause and another very curious thing was that one might be sitting by a very bright fire when without any apparent cause it would suddenly go out and leave nothing but inky blackness the first night i slept in my room in this peculiar house i examined it most thoroughly but there was nothing out of the common to be seen my door which i most carefully locked flew open with a bang though the bolt still remained out i again closed and relocked the door and put a chair against it but to my astonishment the door once more flew open and hurled the chair across the room after that i decided to leave the door wide open and see what would happen next i got quite accustomed to the burbilangs or flying lights they were like pretty fireworks nothing more happened to me for several days till one morning i awoke about two o'clock to find a youngish-looking monk seated in an armchair 
fear not he said sister elfrida i left this earth many years ago in life my name was walter desmond but when i became a monk at st anthony i was known as brother stanilaus as a rule i am invisible but can assume my bodily shape if necessary in life i was at st andrews durham and cambridge when in cambridge i asked did you know the writer of st andrews ghost stories no i only knew him by sight i was very young then and was quite afraid of him as i heard when getting on the links he used to become very violent if he missed a putt topped a drive foozled an iron shot or got into any of the numerous ditches which intersect the cambridge links but i came specially to see you to-night to tell you how to rid this house of the evil influence there is over it i have here a manuscript regarding it which i took from a foreign library and which i wish you to read and act upon and so purify this house and render it habitable but i must impose the strictest secrecy on you in regard to what you read reveal it to no one but how will you get that paper back i asked the brother oh time and space are nothing to us i got this paper from that distant library only a few seconds ago and when you have digested it it will be immediately replaced from whence it came only follow all the directions carefully or my visit will have been of no avail we read the paper over together most carefully but of that i may say no more having told you what to do said the monk i fear i must high hints i have much to do to-night after replacing the paper i will fulfil all that you have asked me brother i said and hope that it will make this house less fearsome but before you go brother i said as you are a cambridge man why do you not pay a visit to the author of st andrew's ghost stories he would not see me because i would not materialize myself there i could only appear as a puff of smoke or as it were a light fog thanks sister i said do not ask any nasty damp fogs to come and call on me she laughed the monk in vanishing said remember sister no bolts locks or bars can keep us from going where we choose i got up and thanked her and proceeded to put on a greatcoat i never wear greatcoats i said in scotland but i am afraid of the cambridge damp so i borrowed this topcoat from colonel church timber you have dropped something out of the pocket said the sister hello i said this is a piece of classical music which must belong to macbeth church timber the colonel's son now good night and many thanks sister elfrida i descended the stairs and said good night to the cruets and patricia as i wandered down the street to the theatre in the damp foggy evening i pondered over what sister elfrida had told me and as i lit my pipe i kept thinking of those people the mutilated football the animated hairpin and the monk brother stanilaus to whom locks bolts and bars were as nothing and who had the nasty habit of appearing to his friends as a damp cloud a habit i think not to be encouraged sister elfrida now informs me that the peculiar house is now quite normal and that all the bogies have vanished into thin air End of story seventeen. End of St. Andrew's Ghost Stories by William Thomas Linskill.